so excited to join you again this month. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Yarian. I'm the Dog Aging Project Social Media Specialist at Texas A&M. And before we get started, we have a brief news roundup about the Dog Aging Project. We've been pretty busy. Now, first up, if you haven't already, make sure to follow us on all our social media channels. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. So go find us. And if you do already, thank you so much. <laughs> but so if you do follow us, you may have seen all the incredible work from our team lately. Several of our team members have presented at conferences and symposiums. They've published papers that you can check out and read on the Dog Aging Project website. Now, while you're on our website, go explore our blog. We're constantly creating blog posts about our studies, and our recent blog post is about inflammation and aging. This subject is an important part of our research that we're conducting with the help from members of the Precision Cohort. So thank you, members. To learn more about this condition or how our research team is studying it, we invite you to read our blog post by Dr. Sarah Sneed entitled Fountain of Youth, Understanding and Blaming and Why We Age. Now, finally, we created a flyer. <laughs> so if you're subscribed to our monthly newsletters, you may have already seen this. Um, it's an awesome flyer that you can print out that has some tabs and share the love, right? We're always eager to welcome new participants to the dog aging pack, one per household. <laughs> if you know someone with a dog or if you're a regular in the neighborhood dog park, then post these flyers and help us grow the dog aging pack, right? Together, you can help us put community in community science and we couldn't do this without you. Now, bonus for all you pack members who are currently watching. If you post a picture of your flyer to the dog park, you'll earn a new promoter badge. So head over to the dog park to learn about participation badges. They're super cool. I know I always look forward to that. So go do it, go get a new badge. Now, today's event is on dog mobility and gait analysis, which is going to be super fascinating, really. Especially if you ever wonder how dogs can run so fast or how a big dog moves differently from a small dog or even a horse. So if you're interested in this, today's event's for you. Joining us today is Dr. Amanda Tinkle from Texas A&M University. She'll be talking about physical activity and mobility and how they're related to dog morphology, which is their shape and size, and how these characters statistics influence the physical aging we observe in dogs. It's exciting stuff. I know I'm excited. Now, today's event has been pre-recorded, but no worries. It's going to remain on our YouTube channel that you can view anytime you want and you can share. Now, today's event, we did try to take as many of your questions as we could before recording this event, but if you still have more questions, have no fear. You can head over to the dog park and we will answer them there. Now, while you're at the dog park, it's our community forum exclusively for pack members. Be sure to enter in a giveaway for the Sun Dog Aging Project stickers. Now, without further ado, over to you, Amanda. All right, guys. So today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the gate analysis, um, which is a little bit about me and my background and, and then um, the uses that the Dog Aging Project and you at home can have. Um, and so uh, to give you a little bit of background on me is that I got a PhD in animal science. And my PhD was the effect of functional claw trimming on the gait analysis of swine. And that's just a fancy way of saying that I was a pig pedicurist and personal trainer for five years for a whole a swine herd at uh, the University of Georgia. And basically what I did for five years is that I had the wonderful pleasure of um, giving pigs pedicures and um, little nail trims on a regular basis, and then seeing what changed. And if we could, um, providing them with the opportunity to improve their gait and then analyzing that gait um, to see if we can improve how they move, just like your personal trainer does on a regular basis when you aren't walking right. Um, and so basically the whole idea of gait analysis is that it is studying how an animal or a human moves um, using the eye and the brain. But uh, we have the benefit of using instruments to help us do this. Um, and the biggest help is our wonderful cameras, which have come so far in the last few years that you can actually use the camera on your cell phone. Um, to actually record the, your animals walking and um, or jogging or running um, and actually watch how they move by slowing down the video. And so here um, I actually have my horse, um, Karma, and she's going to show you guys how a four-legged animal of any variety besides the random crocodile um, would walk. 
And so here we have a nice walking gait and you see that that back leg goes and then the front leg and the back leg. And let me, the opposite back leg and front leg, let me play that one more time so you can get a nice view of how that walk goes, right? And it's really easy to see in a horse because they got those long legs and not much going on for fur. Um, and that is why horses were the original animals that we did get analysis in. And so that is our, our simple walking gait. And we also have, sorry guys, um, we also have the trot, um, which is the next gate up and that's a two beat pattern. And it's a nice, easy um, kind of, you see the symmetry to that gate. And the reason that this gate is, is so nice for, for us is that we, that symmetry, um, being able to look at a gate that is symmetrical helps us to kind of see what's going wrong. And so I have in this slide here, I actually have all the, a couple of the measurements, I shouldn't say all, but a couple of the measurements for you guys to kind of see how much information that you can get out of, out of just a, a gate at this slow motion. And so here we have her stepping down and, uh, and as she steps and puts weight down on that foot, you can see that, um, that timer starts. And what we're seeing here is the different timers running that you can get all the time points and then the angles of her legs going from as far back to as far forward as that leg will go. And then we start tracking that foot and following how it flows across the ground. And all of this information kind of gives us how the, the basic information on how this animal is moving. And, and the reason that is important is it kind of tells us, you know, how, what's going on internally with those joints. And maybe in, in the case of the pigs that I worked on, um, what we can improve um, or if we did do something to them, was their improvement? Um, for those pigs that I trimmed feet on, did, the, did we see uh, you know, a difference in how they moved forward? Were they more willing to move forward? Were they more efficient in how they moved? You know, think of it as you know, when you're walking across uh, the floor for, for the ladies uh, and you're wearing high heels, you know, you, your stride or, or how far you step forward is much shorter than if you were in a pair of flip-flops. Um, and that's the, the same basics behind our gait analysis. And so um, when we talk about gait patterns, uh, we'll, we'll move over to the dogs to highlight. Um, there, there are quite a few gates that you can have and, and gait patterns, but they're, they're, they follow a strict pattern for all animals that are four-legged. Um, for the most part, like I said, alligators um, happen to be one of those ones that are quite different, but it, just like horses, our dogs have that same kind of football pattern where those back limbs at a walk will hit the ground first, followed by those front feet, and then the opposite side will follow suit. And so when you're watching your dog walk, and you're looking at this, this should follow the same pattern every step they take. And so if you start seeing um, that, that walking pattern start not to be as, as evenly matched or, or it starts to look like maybe they're not following that pattern, you know you have an issue. And, and it's even to someone who doesn't have this technology to speed things up, at times you can absolutely see when your, your dog is limping, um, that there is pain and, and a problem. It's just that with this camera system, I can see it a lot faster. And so, and so when we go on to a trot or this two beaded gate in a dog, um, we have two different types. We have the same, some um, opposite side symmetrical gate as you see here. So we see that the opposite two feet land roughly at the same time. Pretty darn cute. And then we also see uh, what is called a pacing gate. 
And both of these are the same, same type of pace or same type of gait um, speed. So they normally, it's kind of like what we would consider a jogging pace. Um, so somewhere in between a walk and a, and a full out run. Um, and so they're, they're both two beat gates. It's just that some dogs choose to um, have both feet on the same side go um, in this. And then some dogs choose to have a diagonal leg. So the front right and hind left might go at the same time. And, and there is no reason for this, except that it's just a preference for some dogs. Um, some dogs you might see their breed um, has kind of a preferential cho choice to that. Um, and, uh, and it is perfectly fine either way. And some dogs switch in between. My dog, for example, um, paces and trots, uh, the two beat cross, cross beat or paces on the same side, um, just whenever she chooses to. Uh, and lastly, of course, out of all of these, uh, we have the full out run. And that is where all four feet hit separate from each other. And, um, and there we have no feet hitting at the same time. Um, and then of course, never to be left out, we have the small dog bunny hop because you can never leave out little dogs, no little bunny hops. Um, but all of these gates are normal and, um, and they can be individual to each dog. Dogs are like all people, can, are um, individuals and have their own way of moving. Um, but what is important and what, what is useful for you to take home is that you should probably, you can look at your dog and pay attention to how they move. And if that changes over time, then you know that something might be going on. And then you might wanna consider talking to your vet. So now that we've gone through the different paces that your animal might do, what are the different things that we actually measure when we're looking at gait analysis? So when we're talking about gait analysis, the first thing we can talk about is stance. And stance is the amount of time that your dog is holding weight on that leg. And here we see a video of it where we have that nice weight bearing limb and then that weight comes off and the timer stops. And so here we see that the right front is about 18 seconds and the left front is about 17 seconds. And so we have a dog who is taking about the same amount of time on both front limbs um, to support the weight. So that's a good sign that the dog is willing to bear weight across the front end equally. It's good. So the opposite of stance is swing. And so where stance was bearing weight, swing is taking the weight off the limb. And so here we see dog bears weight, and then you can kind of track where that foot goes through the air. And it takes about 17 seconds. So it takes about 17, 18 seconds holding the weight, 17 seconds through the air. So it's about an eat, that's even, um, even amount of time bearing weight, air, uh, time through the air. Um, so that dog's gait, it's pretty symmetrical for both stance and swing. Um, once again, no, and, uh, and pay attention. And then the in-between these two measurements um, is breakover. And breakover is the amount of time it takes for your dog's foot to actually come off the ground. And so this video, I slowed it down quite a bit um, so that it's easier for you guys to see because okay, this is a really fast measurement. Um, and so you see there, it picks this little foot up. It takes about 0 0.07 seconds. So that's really quick. Um, and the faster this is, the faster that little foot can come off the ground, um, the less stress that goes across that foot um, and the better off your dog's joints are. And so then 
you take swing and stance together and we have stride duration. And that is the amount of time from when the foot hit the ground the first time, the next time that the foot hit the ground. And so we see for both front feet, we have a about 0.35 and 0.33 seconds. And that once again, those are pretty close together. And so that's telling, what that tells me is that this dog's fairly even across the front end. Um, and if we were to do multiple runs, which you would do for data analysis, you wouldn't just base any measurement off of just one video or one um, run across the, or one like gait cycle. Um, it probably that would average out to be identical. And so this dog's more than likely sound at this point um, and in good health joint wise. And lastly, the easy one, it's stride length. And that is the length from one stance or where the foot was bearing weight to the next point that the, the foot was bearing weight. And it's just that distance between the two. And what that shows us is how big of a step that dog is taking. And so once again, it's, it's getting that kind of, how far out is that dog willing to step um, with each stride? And so um, it's really important that we look at all these measurements together because it kind of gives us an overall idea of, of what the health of the dog is. And so what does this all add up to? Because I mean, these are just numbers, right? It's just measurements and, and just, gait patterns, and it really means nothing um, when that, without looking at it globally, right? And so what it means is if we go back to looking at all of those measurements I showed you with the horse, is that if we look at all these numbers and think of it on a global scale, um, you can kind of start seeing patterns, especially if you start looking over multiple time points and multiple strides. Or, or multiple steps that that dog or horse or pig is taking. And it kind of gives you an idea of, of what, what is, what the overall health of that dog is. And so for us at the Dog Aging Project, it is important for us to do because what we're gonna do is look at dogs over time. That's the whole point of our study, right? And so we'll look at these dogs and we'll look at them starting now, right? And we will follow them each year. And so theoretically, if your dog walks, does this and walks, and we record a number, great. That's a starting point for us. And that number, if it doesn't change for the next five years, that also tells us something. It tells us your dog hasn't changed. We're good to go. But if we start seeing any bit of that number start to change, we can note, hey, something about that dog, the gait isn't, isn't, isn't quite right. And so we can start thinking, well, maybe we're starting to see changes that might tell us that there might be some arthritis starting to develop. Because the magic of gait analysis is, is that gait analysis picks up on stuff that we don't pick up as owners nearly as quickly as we would hope because it's, a, it's time and cameras, they're numbers, right? That we don't see with the blind eye. And, and what is magical about gain analysis, cameras, timers, and all that is, it's more sensitive than our eyes. And it can pick up on minute changes, small little things that on the day-to-day, -day, we don't notice. And so small changes that might lead up to something like arthritis, like hip dysplasia um, can get picked up. And in fact, when you're doing something at like the gait analysis videos, um, we can pick up on very minor changes that will that could hint at lameness later. Um, they've done plenty of studies where they've actually found that they can see lameness coming on before any lameness, even the sign of lameness is there. And so there's actually arguments when you start seeing soreness in a dog or a horse is 
that soreness secondary to something else because we're already starting to see that kind of limp that you might see that little bob of the head prior to any sort of inflammation or pain response. Um, and so now cutting edge studies are starting to look into what comes first, chicken egg type situations for some of this stuff. And so um, that is why it's important to us, the dog aging project is we want to start trying to catch some of this stuff as quickly as possible so that we can start getting ahead and trying to figure out what type of things can we help preventative wise and treatment wise to help dogs as quickly as possible for you looking at home. Once again, you are happily can go and watch your dog walk, trot, run and just pay attention to how they're running, walking, and trotting. Um, because the more you pay attention to things like that and notice small little changes yourself, you might be able to catch something, even if you don't know what's wrong yet, um, you might be able to catch something um, and get your dog into um, the vet as soon as possible before it becomes something more major. Um, it, even something as small as the toenail being a little bit sore can make a big difference to our dogs. Um, I know it does to mine at least. So how will the dog, how will the dog aging project kind of go about great analysis? Obviously we can't go to everyone's house and record your dogs and then measure all of these things. Um, so once again, we're going to ask you to help us. And so that will be part of our mobility and morphometrics. And so the first part of mobility and morph morphometrics is our mobility part. And so for mobility, we're going to ask you to walk your dogs um, every year for us across the track. And so this track is going to um, have a nice little start and finish line. Uh, we're going to ask you guys to have it in a safe space for your dog, whatever that might be. Um, and so we'll ask for two different things. One will be your dog walking on a leash at a, at a nice little jog pace. Um, and you're going to jog them from the start line to the finish line and you'll time it. Then you're going to ask your dog to run as fast as they can. And in that case, they are going to be off leash and you're going to ask them to go in any method you want. And so here we see our little dog who loves toys running, running his heart out. Okay. So this task, these, this task um, obviously will be done with your, with you and your dog's wellness in mind. If your dog is unable to run for whatever reason, or it isn't really safe, you don't have a safe environment, that's fine. We don't ask you to do it unless you and your dog are absolutely able to, and it's a safe area. But if you can, this is going to be fun. I think your dogs will really enjoy it. The next part of it, we'll be asking your dogs to go up a set of stairs. And so the stairs kind of will, the stair will demonstrate basically how well your dog's mobility um, to move upward is. And so here we have a fairly young, small dog. And as you can see, she's a real go-getter. And she can pretty much just scale those stairs in less than two seconds. And so, you know, if you've got a young dog who can bound up the stairs, fantastic. Um, but you know, some of our bigger dogs, While they might try to bound, they've got a little bit more uh, heft that they have to fight against gravity. Just totally okay. And then for our older children, only if they if they uh, want to. But as you can see, as our as our dogs um, age pace does change and that's okay. And all dogs totally allowed to take these stairs however they want to at whatever pace. 
Um, the whole point of this is that they do it at whatever pace they are comfortable to do it and as quickly as they want to. Um, and that's going to change from year to year, and that's okay. Um, the more important part is we do it safely and we do it you know, to the best of their ability. So now that we've done the mobility part um, and the gain analysis part, we're going to talk about the morphometrics. And the morphometrics kind of gives us an idea of what body type does your dog have. And this is really cool because this will give us an idea of kind of what makes up your dog. Like it is 100% we know that what breed your dog is, but if you have a dog that's mixed breed, and they might have a little bit of dachshund or bulldog in them. Well, they might have some of these characteristics that make up these breeds. And so measuring things like their head length and circumference will give us an idea of what makes up um, like body structure wise. It's kind of like us, like every dog is an individual. And so measuring their bodies and figuring out like what um, body type they are, like, do they have really long legs, really long backs, short legs? Um, it all kind of gives us an idea of what makes your dog, but it also gives us an idea of what to expect for um, health wise for your dog. You know, if your dog does have the um, long back, like a dachshund, we do, there are things such as um, a higher risk of, of disc disease or having bad, you know, back injuries that occur with having such a long back um, that we would be, you know, watching out for because we do know that risk is there. The other thing that doing this, um, these measurements does is it allows us to know if your dog is missing a limb and, and then, you know, if you do have a limb missing, you know, what is that doing to that other limb? Like if, you know, they've got a back limb missing such as the dog in this picture, do they have a really, you know, large thigh on the other side because they really built that muscle up to support the, the weight. Um, and so measuring stuff from year to year helps us to understand not only body type, but also muscle, you know, and what makes that your dog, your dog, and how are they, how are they doing health wise? And so this also is a, a wonderful activity for you because you get to um, get an up and personal with your dog and um, really get to know what the makeup of your dog is as far as their body measurements. Um, and as you see, uh, most of the dogs really enjoyed this activity because they got to give us nice kisses and uh, get up in our faces uh, the whole time we were doing this. So the overall message for all of this, of course, is that while it may seem seamless and, and, and it is a lot of fun, uh, we do know that this isn't going to be um, perfect and it wasn't perfect for us either. And we do want you to know that if you do try any of these activities at home, that that's okay if there's mistakes. Um, we're, we are fallible and so are our dogs. Um, and mistakes happen. And the more important part is, is to note that mistakes happen. And that if something goes awry, um, that that's okay too. If they happen to run past you for the treat bag, just note it in your, in your log. And, um, and move on. This is supposed to represent your dog to the best of their ability, no matter how goofy they are. As with all tasks in the Dog Aging Project, this will go out to some of you this year, and then others will receive this in following years. That's okay. We will be expanding it out as we can. Um, this activity, um, as you can see, it's going to be pretty um, intense. Um, for some people. And so we want to make sure with everything that we have the capability to support you guys. And so we don't want to just release it out to all 30,000 of you. Um, if for any reason you do notice something wrong with your dog during this video uh, or during this um, timing session where you do note that there's some lameness issues, 
Uh, we do recommend that you go to your vet as soon as possible, or at least go talk to them because they know your dog better than we do. Um, and we are unable to really help you out much from here at Texas A&M. Uh, if you guys do have any questions about the activity itself, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you um, through the activity as you receive it. All right, guys, so looking at some questions, I see that a really common question that we have here is about supplements and how they affect mobility. And there's been lots of studies on supplementation um, related to mobility, specifically around um, joint supplementations like cosequin and chondroitin. Um, and those are really heavily studied and they, they are, um, for the most part have been shown to have um, pretty good improvements on dogs. Um, the biggest thing to remember with both is that it is a really cheap um, supplementation for your dog. Um, so it is something that you can start while they are young and um, helps to kind of support the joint. Most joint supplements, if you are going to do it, will work better if you do them um, prior to any injury because they're going to help support um, damage before it happens. It's going to help prevent damage over um, kind of fixing anything. Most of the time when you have joint damage, there's not much you can do to help it. And that is true in humans as well. If you were to um, tear your knee joint, uh, or damage that joint capsule, there's not much you can do besides actually going in and having surgery on that knee. Um, so if you wanted to, to kind of help support that knee and the joint fluid in there, the best thing you can do is, is kind of supplement and help support that prior to having the, the knee. Having said that, um, you know, anything that you do supplement, talk to your vet before anything else, um, because your vet will be able to help guide you as to what to supplement. Supplements um, are not regulated. And so it is really easy to end up spending a lot of money with not a lot of good. Um, so it is the best person to help guide you on that path is your vet. Um, so definitely go talk to them. All right, so a question from Shelly I see here is about physical therapy and mobility issues. She says her Boston's been um, doing some water treadmill therapy. Um, so I think we can talk about that a little bit. Physical therapy is always amazing. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, dogs, just like humans, can get a little bit of physical therapy prior to having injuries or in those cases where we've done surgery on any limbs um, or joints particularly. Um, we, most vets, um, specialty hospitals um, or that hospital, like um, teaching hospitals do offer some sort of physical therapy um, kind of center. And what is really cool is that they um, do things like water treadmills to kind of help dogs um, get the physical therapy that they need while taking the weight um, off of that joint or leg. Um, and so they get the exercise to rebuild up the muscles to help support those joints and legs um, and kind of get the mobility back in so that they won't re-injure themselves. Um, and the dogs love it. Um, in fact, for those of you who always ask us about the CATs, they love it too. Um, and so it is a really cool option. Other things that they do is they go and they walk around with the physical therapist and they do things just like humans do where they have to step over things, walk around things. And it's all about doing these exercises that are specific for whatever their injury is um, to kind of help rebuild up what was lost due to surgery or because the injury um, 
cause them to kind of, you know, hold that limb. Um, just like you, whenever you get hurt, you'll stop using whatever that is. And so you have to rebuild up all that stuff. And so physical therapy is a fantastic thing that you can do. Um, even if you haven't, um, done something like surgery, if, you, if your dog has been injured and, um, has, has gone on cage rest or, or need something, um, as they, as they age, they might need a little bit more help, um, you know, regaining some of their, their mobility. Um, definitely physical therapy is, is a wonderful idea. And, in most vets, um, veterinarians can definitely talk to you about that. Um, your, your primary vet is once again, a wonderful source of information. If you're interested in any of this, because they, once again, know your pet better than anyone else besides you. And so I highly recommend if you, if you are interested in physical therapy for your dog, talking to your um, primary vet about that option. Right. Next, we have a question from Chili and she wanted to know, she was interested in uh, a balance of physical activity versus sports injuries. She says she has a 15 year old Bisola, congratulations, um, who is active, who was, I apologize, was active in agility and field. And she asked if these activities increase or decrease the length and quality of life for our pups. Um, and just like people, Activity has been shown to greatly increase um, like lifespan of animals. Um, it's it truly is a use it or lose it type situation. Um, this obviously um, is with the asterisk. If you can use it or lose it, that is obviously not true. If if there's any injuries, rest is best type situation. Um, but if your dog is physically able to going out and even walking around for 20 to 30 minutes a day is really important for their overall health. And it, it definitely improves their chances of living a longer, healthier life and benefit. You get to spend 20, 30 minutes outside with your dog and it helps your life. Um, so definitely, definitely um, doing physical activity and getting out there and moving is definitely a good, good thing. Um, the more active you can be, you and your dog, the better are, the off you are. So definitely go out there and go play with some pups. Okay. Our um, next question is from Judith Reynolds, and she asked um, if dogs with relatively square frames, for example, beagles or cockers, are less apt to have mobility issues in old age than those with elongated frames such as bassets and dachshunds? And the answer is, it depends. Depends on what type of mobility issues you're asking about. If you're asking, are they less likely to have back injuries? The answer is yes, most definitely. Dogs with a long back will almost always have a higher chance of having back injuries compared to those uh, like a beaker, beagle or a cocker spaniel. Um, but, you know, beagle or a cocker spaniel has just as, are just as likely to have injured a leg or, you know, have some sort of, um, you know, arthritis somewhere in their hips or their um, knees as any basset or dachshund. Um, what makes that different is their leg composition. If a basset or a dachshund has um, not so much the square frame, but the legs that are kind of twisted, then that will increase the chances of them having leg injuries. And so that once again, gets back into that whole um, morphometrics thing. And so trying to figure out, do you, do you happen to have a dog who's got some legs that aren't quite straight? Um, all these things kind of blend into there and figuring out, you know, what, what are your chances of having a secondary issues? Because if your dog's frame, 
Um, the other half of Judith's question is, uh, why do so many breeds have hip dysplasia issues and are mixed breeds less likely to have problems? And so um, this is, is definitely something that we are highly interested in as far as the hip dysplasia question, because we are, that's one of the things we're trying to study is we're trying to figure out why dogs, we have so many breeds with hip dysplasia. Um, it is part of it is structural, of course, and trying to figure out why it is so prevalent is a fantastic question. And um, the mixed breed part is a question that we are looking at genetic wise. It's why we are DNA testing all of our dogs to figure out what um, of our mixed breed dogs, what are, what is their background in figuring out, do they have one of these dogs that are one of these breeds that is predispositioned to having hip dysplasia or did they just get, you know, a, the bad end of the deal and got hip dysplasia in spite of not having one of these breeds. And so that is, um, what makes this study great is that we are not only going to be doing mobility and morphometrics, but we're going to be tying that back to those DNA kits that some of you guys got as well. And so we're pulling in some of the pack that got those DNA kits, some of the pack that's going to get this mobility and morphometrics. And then some of you guys may or may not get it. That's okay too. Like the combination of all of you guys are going to end up giving us an answer to this type of question. And that is, that is what makes this project the best and why we appreciate you guys and everything that you do for us on a daily basis. Looks like our last question will be from Xena Warrior Princess. And her question is her and her dog, Xena, so the dog asked the question this time, I'm glad she can type for us, um, just finished six months of rehab. And she wants to know what makes some breeds more prone to CCLD um, injuries. Is it body shapes and size? Is it more related to gen uh, genetic traits? Or is it more related to environmental activity the dog was involved in or a combination? And she said her dog is, or Zena, is a German Shepherd mix who is around 95 pounds. So um, that question is something that uh, we, once again, we would like to know because honestly, it is, it is a prevalent thing. Um, and so trying to figure out why we see it a lot in some breeds over another, it, uh, it definitely is something that we want to study and we want to figure out. And we do want to know if it is, it is prevalent amongst um, amongst all of our, our pack or just, it just feels like it's amongst all um, because it, it hits you particularly hard when it is your own dog as, as it should. Um, and so hopefully by the end of this study, we'll have some of these answers for you guys. All right, guys, it looks like that's it for us today. I appreciate all you guys joining us um, for this wonderful pack event. Uh, we can't wait to see how uh, your dogs move and what shapes and sizes we have out in that pack. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get this um, activity out to you guys soon. Um, and if not, look forward to it in the next year or so. Um, have a great um, month and we will see you next month in June. All right, that concludes our May pack event. A huge thank you to Dr. Tinkle for sharing her knowledge about dog mobility and gait analysis. That was super insightful and fascinating. And I mean, I really enjoyed all those videos and her explanation was really good. So hopefully you liked it too. Now, if Dr. Tinkle didn't get to answer your question today, keep an eye out at the dog park. We'll be answering more questions throughout the week. And one question we hear a lot about is caring for your dog in old age. I just wanna mention that we have a couple articles that's on our website, including a series about senior dogs. And we're gonna have more on the way in the coming months. So stay tuned, check out our website to get all this information. Now, PAC members who are currently on watching, thank you so much. We truly appreciate your ongoing participation. We couldn't do this without you. Now, quick reminder, if you haven't already, go to the dog park and enter in our pack appreciation giveaway. We'll announce the winners there. 
And of course, if you have any remaining questions, go put them at the dog park. Now, speaking of the dog park, a quick shout out to Eric. He's our dog father of the dog park, our tech group behind the scenes, and he put this wonderful event together. So thank you, Eric. Also be sure to come back next month, right? Our June pack appreciation event, where it's gonna be a good one. And also don't forget to share the love, right? <laughs> so if you have any dog loving friends, tell them about the Dog Aging Project. We're always eager to welcome new people to the Dog Aging Pack, one for household. And we will be so grateful for your help for spreading the word. And you can do so by printing out these flyers and posting them at dog parts or anywhere you feel it's appropriate. So thank you again for joining us today. And we'll see you next time. Bye.